This is Oscar Extra, the visual version of our pop-up radio channel. We are analysing the Oscar Pistorius trial as we build up towards Judgment Day. Our experts, you've heard them many times on Oscar Extra, on Manny Wits, Tyron Maseko and Cliffy Alexander. Right now, we'll have a look at the defence case and the state's case. And let me start with you, Cliffy, with regards to the state's case, relying obviously heavily on the neighbours uh, to prove that there was a fight which caused Oscar Pistorius to shoot Reva Steenkamp. Is that it in a nutshell? Uh, yes and no, David. Um, I think that there are problems pertaining to the neighbours, the timing per se of when the screams <coughs> emanated. Um, there seemed to be exact timing because of the phone calls that were made. Um, Barry Root covered this ad nauseum in his heads of arguments, and I think to an extent he might have a point. Um, the judge is, is facing a hard task, as are the learned assessors, uh, pertaining to making a finding that, yes, there was a, a screaming row uh, which emanated from the Oscar Pistorius household, mm -hmm. uh, which then led to his killing, either premeditated or dolus directus. She might still find that. She might still find that the, the threads that were all woven together by the different witnesses, four or five witnesses per se, now why would all these people make it up? To a large extent, the versions do corroborate one another, although there are contradictions. The question is, are there material contradictions? I think that the best state witness that we heard was Oscar Pistorius himself. He single-handedly <laughs> sunk himself. Yeah, himself. I say that with the greatest of respect. But does the, um, Tyra, does the state's case fall apart should the judge not accept the evidence of these, of the neighbours? If she feels that they, they would not have heard a woman screaming and accept the defence version that they had gunshots and then a cricket bat? Not at all. Not at all. Um, and a simple, Oscar Pistorius, I mean, his, uh, his biggest risk, uh, certainly one that he can be assured that he's going to be convicted on, as far as I'm concerned, is coupled with homicide, at best for him. So that still remains a risk for him. And the simple reason is this, David, is that forget, put aside um, the witnesses, the factual witnesses of the, of the state, you know, all these neighbors and what they've said. And you work simply with Oscar Pistorius' version of things. The problem that I have with his version is that, notwithstanding the, the fact that he, you know, he couldn't bring himself to, uh, uh, to say that he actually fired the gun intentionally or not, you put all of this, the problem that he has is that at the end of the day, he pulled, we know for a fact that he pulled that, that, that trigger, and he's the one who actually killed River Stengham. He's considered that. Now the question is, was he negligent in, in his actions? And as far as I'm concerned, he was, because there's so many other actions that he could have taken. It doesn't make sense. It's not rational that you would act in the way that he did under those circumstances. And so, at the very least, he still faces the risk of being convicted uh, um, for, cul for culpable homicide. Okay, and there's, an, yeah, there's okay. an involvement of the firearm in, in this instance, which you know the, triggers the... Uh, the provisions of minimum sentencing. So that's another point that he faces. I'm just wondering, on the issue of the culpable homicide, uh, one of the issues raised by the defence, Manny, was that should that be a consideration for the judge and her assessors, well, for, well, for the judge on this, because it's the point of law, uh, is that Oscar Pistorius should be judged according to the standard of the reasonable disabled person. Now, that will create new law if the judge accepts it. If the judge accepts it, because uh, at this stage, South African law is against that. They judge the reasonable man or the reasonable woman in those circumstances Circumstances. And just getting back to what you said to uh, Tyron and to Cliff, to Cliffy, I think it's actually very, very simple here. Forgetting about the neighbours, forgetting about everybody, it's actually quite a simple case. You've got your victim, unfortunately the late Reaver, you've got your smoking gun and you've got your shooter. So the judge just simply has to decide at the end of the day, leave all that evidence aside. Did he act reasonably in the circumstances? And I think we are differ slightly from Tyron, even though I think he's got certain valid legal points is on a very, very simple aspect. The defence all along, you can see the way they've been threading their case and trying to put their case together piece by piece. It's always been, if at worst we get convicted, let's go for culpable homicide, negligent killing of a human being. And it's very, very simple. If the judge accepts that he acted honestly but erroneously, that Dr. Stipp was correct, he said, I made a mistake, I thought it was an intruder, I shot at the intruder, then the judge simply has to have a look. If that evidence is reasonably possibly true, the minute you knock out Dolus, which is the intention, and that's the end of murder. Any, any murder in any form, eventualis, directus, or premeditated murder. Then you go to what Tyron says. Then you look at the negligence. Was it a negligent killing of a human being? But I think, as Cliffy has, I think, most correctly said, I don't think anybody could have put it better. 
I think he was his own worst enemy, Oscar. He gave the state a lot of uh, support and a lot of credence for their own version and the version that they wanted to prove by his own quality of his evidence. And I think at the end of the day, that own evidence that he gave, his viva voca, his own verbal evidence, and his cross-examination, his performance is going to sink him. And um, I think, if anything, if one looks at his actions, forget about the same automatism, forget about everything. You shoot in those circumstances where there's no imminent danger. So the African law has always been clear. It doesn't matter whether you're disabled, it doesn't matter who you are. In those circumstances, you shoot through a closed or a locked door, as it turned out to be, but a closed door. Never mind what sounds you hear, you can hear any sounds in the world. There's no imminent danger, and in fact, there's no danger at all. And if the, that doesn't exist, you've definitely exceeded the bounds of self-defence, then you've got problems. My thanks to our experts, Manny Witts, Tyra Maseko and Cliffy Alexander. Look out for more analysis on the Oscar Pistorius trial.